Oh, hello, am I through to Mr Mulligan Price at Belfast Church of Christ? That's right, yeah. Oh, right. Um, I'm trying to find out about the Church of Christ. My name's Robert. I'm a man in my 50s from Plymouth. Um, I've been looking on various websites at various churches. I, I've noticed a lot of churches here in Plymouth. I, I, I live in Plymouth. Practice sure. tithing, um, compulsory giving to the church. Um, so I've been looking at a lot of different churches, mostly Pentecostal churches I've been looking at. Um, but I've come across your website and you teach giving instead of tithing and I'm a bit puzzled by that. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to help. Thank you. What's your motive for asking about? We get lots of inquiries. Are you, are you moving to Belfast? Are you, are you visiting, or no? Um, I live in Plymouth. I'm uh, I'm an unemployed person. I do do voluntary work, though. I just don't get paid for it. I'm in my late fifties. Um, I have been looking at the Bible for many, many years, but I don't attend any fellowship. Um, so I'm trying to find out about really tithing, giving baptism, the position of authority within the church. I, I can't see it being, being with apostles because I've been told uh, at various churches that there are apostles and prophets in the church today and usually Pentecostal churches claim that they have these prophets and apostles, they're called the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, no, that doesn't wash with me because I think the apostles had to actually witness the resurrected Christ in Acts chapter 1. Uh, verses yeah. 21 to 24 so I don't think that applies to TV preachers like Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland, I don't think they've seen the resurrected Christ so it's, sure. um, that's what I'm looking at at the moment mostly tithing and giving but also I'm curious about baptism and the authority of the church or claimed authority for the church Wow so Robert you raise, you raise a whole uh, quagmire of issues <laughs> in terms of the the religious community. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, I just, we, we, I just get lots of inquiries. My time is limited because I'm here to serve right now the Belfast community. And so obviously we have a church here where it's out of Protestants and Catholics alike. And um, I mean, you know, our, our doctrine, uh, we, don't, we don't hold to, you know, a, a Protestant or a Catholic um, yeah, rhetoric in the sense of uh, salvation or some of the practices, even you mentioned there, we... We consider ourselves a first century church and trying to get back to how people lived around Jesus. What were the, uh, the teachings of Christ, uh, you know, enacted and practiced by, um, by the followers uh, or disciples of Christ in those days? So, so the, the, the Church of Christ doctrine that we would, we would broadly follow um, would, would, you know, are, are, are available online and, you know, you can, you can research them. It's hard for my time. I'm, I'm, I'm cramped right now, even as you catch me. I just always want to take a call. And I did get your message. I'm sorry to get back to you yes, before. Yes, yeah, of course, I know, yes. I know you've, you, you've emailed about a, a court case as well, which, I, again, these are things that I couldn't, I just don't, just the way the Spirit would move my heart to be involved with ministry of the Word and prayer in, in the area that I'm in. I just, I, you know, you know, it's just, I, I can't, um, I mean, I'd love to do more, you know, yeah. So yeah. just put a, put, but so to get into all these areas, I, I can give you a very short synopsis. Put, I, I mean, them now. Could, could yeah. I just ask a question? You say you minister to Catholics and Protestants. Do you regard Catholics and, say, Baptists and Assemblies of God and Calvinists as people who are your brothers in Christ, who you pray, fellowship, and break the bread and the wine with and take communion with? and regard as fellow brothers who will be with you in heaven. So this is where this whole <laughs> topic, so what I was saying is we, we don't know how to do what I said is... Sorry, can we, you say that again? You're breaking up a bit. Sorry, I didn't hear. Sorry, so we, we don't hold to Protestant or Catholic, uh, you know, uh, key doctrines of, of, of faith, from, oh. you know, from, from anything from, so for example, infant baptism that is practiced by... You mentioned baptism that's practiced by, you know, the, the majority of traditional, uh, you know, Protestant groups and, and Catholics. We wouldn't hold to such a view. So, so it, who, 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 you know, who is who is saved and not saved is up to God, and that's in God's hands. I don't, I don't ever get involved in that game. Well, I, I, I thought you said you, you you minister to them. I thought you said you're ministering to Protestants and Catholics in Belfast. Perhaps I misunderstood you. It's, it is hard to hear a mobile sometimes. 
I'm a little old. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, so in the in the sense we're non-denominational. So we we so my, my wife grew up Catholic. I grew up Protestant. We're actually considered a mixed marriage here in Belfast, Robert. It's a very uh, you know uh, unique place to live in Northern yeah. Ireland, and so so we don't use those terms. We don't hold to those documents. We call ourselves disciples of Christ. So we call ourselves biblically to follow, to give up everything to follow Jesus. To, 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 to follow him, take up our cross, deny ourselves, and, and walk as Jesus walked as closely as we can. We're, we're, we're a fallen race of sinners, you know, we, we fall and stumble, but, but we, uh, we make decisions to live a, a repentant lifestyle. So, and I believe all those that would do that would, would, would be baptized for forgiveness of sin, you receive the Holy Spirit. Would be would be doing that too, and would be would be in his in his care and his covenant. But um, but you know I, we welcome anyone into the church. We'd welcome from a sexism into the church. We'd welcome anybody into the church who, who practices whatever they practice. We'd welcome them and we'd sit down if they're open to looking at the Bible. We'd look at the Bible with them and share what we believe is is true discipleship. Um, so you say baptism. Do you believe? Would you recognise baptism by say the Baptists? or the mainline Church of Christ? Do, do you believe that so, they are Christians, or must they be re so like, by you? Again, Robert, I, like I say, I, I don't, I just don't have the time to get into these, these debates, I'd like these discussions in terms okay. of like, is this know, just, just where I am, my, my ministry here, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapped up here with these things. I, we get lots of inquiries like this online. And phone calls Would there be somebody just, else, yeah. some evangelist you could pass my details on to? And he's getting in contact am, with me. I am the evangelist of the church here. Yeah. Right. What's, what's your position on tithing then? What's your position on tithing? So that's what I've been looking at. You did say that you're like the first century Christians and you give all your things to God. And I have heard people warn that the Church of, International Church of Christ is very much into money and tithing is compulsory or giving 10% of your money is compulsory have I got the wrong end of the stick about that what, what's your position on, on, on giving or, or tithing which do you practice is it giving or tithing or do you regard them as the same Oh, I, I so, look you know, on both I, sides, I, yes. I, sure, I would definitely sure, look on both sure. sides, yes. Yes. So I, I, I do appreciate you, yeah. I do appreciate you coming and, and wanting to hear from the horses now. I do appreciate you, you, you phoning someone, because we get lots of ridiculous uh, harangues from people who, who don't really want to follow the Bible and, and want to either argue. That, that's why maybe I come across a bit sceptical, because we get a lot of uh, criticism for standing up for yeah. Uh, for example, you know, true, true salvation, things like this. So, so I'll give you my nutshell. I'll, I'll, Sorry, I'll someone's coming. There. Sorry, you say that again. Someone's coming in the room. Sorry. Oh, I, I just said um, I appreciate you coming and speaking yeah. to, uh, to, 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 to me, you know, in this way. Well, because we get a lot of people uh, persecution for standing up for truth, as we believe in, you know, uh, baptism or for true repentance or for not holding to, to deadness that, that, like I said, these other groups would hold to. So I appreciate you coming and asking me things. I just, in, you know, obviously time is limited, but I, I was just going to, so I'm tithing and offering, so tithing is not a New Testament principle. Uh, there's no concept of tithing in the 10% of the New Testament. It's the Old Testament law. So the only percentile, if you want to talk in percentages, that is offered in the New Testament is the widow's offering, which is 100%. It's the only time you could say, there's a percentage of offering of money given that is, is held up by by our Lord as saying like this is this is an amount now. Not that anyone needs to give hundred percent, it is it's a, it's it's sacrificial. We need to give in a in a way that we would give of ourselves in, in a sacrificial way. So is it compulsory in the in the ICRC to give? I believe it's it's in, in you know, you can't avoid New Testament Christianity without giving. Someone doesn't want to give I think I've discussed that with them, and you know, I, I don't know who gives. I don't hold the. I don't have to do the money because I don't, that's not my role. I, I, I'm the shepherd and preach, and I preach and teach. But but in terms of, you know, if, if somebody said I, I, I'm not getting came to me with that question, I would definitely encourage them to give. And they use the term compulsory. The, the, the book, you know, the book of uh, Corinthians talks about you know, we should be we should not give under compulsion. It should be a a, you know, uh, something from the heart. So, 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 but in terms of giving, I, you know, I, I think I'd, I'd struggle to, to, to see, you can't take giving out of Christianity in that way. It's, it's, if Jesus is Lord of my 
life. He's Lord of my, my He's Lord of everything I do, my my work, my pocket, everything. So, you know, so I, I need, and that that should be in my in my life now. How much that means, how much I give, is, is totally down to someone's uh, someone's you know uh, faith in in God. Um, you mentioned persecution. I, I my background is in Baptist and. Pentecostal churches, although I don't go anywhere now, I'm frankly, you know, I've seen so much hypocrisy, I just choose to go nowhere oh. now. But I mean, they use the word persecution a lot. They say we're persecuted oh. for our faith. And what they really mean by that is somebody comes up to me who doesn't agree with our doctrines in our Pentecostal church or our Baptist church. Um, I've been in situations where I've been told in Baptist churches and Pentecostal churches on many occasions that Jesus is the Father, I've then referred to them to their own doctrinal statement of faith on the website, which says that God is triune, he's a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son in Trinitarian theology, he's not the Father, that's modalism. And they then use that same word that you use, persecution. They claim that I'm persecuting them, when all I'm saying is, look at your own doctrinal statement of faith for this church, where you are an alpha leader, or an elder, or a home group leader, and what you're telling me that Jesus is the Father is contrary to your church doctrinal statement. And they would say, you're persecuting me. We're being persecuted. <laughs> so when you use the word persecuted, what do you mean? So, Robert, you, you, you read about, yeah, it's, it's so I mean, how much, you, you sound like a man who's well read. And oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Church, right? Yeah, so, yeah. How would you describe our persecution? What do you, what do you think I mean? Uh, well, I say people who go to prison or people who die for their faith or people who have their possessions taken from them because of their stand for Christ. I think that's persecution. Yeah. Being spat yeah. at, being punched for Christ. Yeah. Um, but yeah. not somebody who says, hey, buddy, you know, this is really interesting. I'd like to look at this. Maybe I take a different stance. I mean, I mean, for instance, for, for, for instance, let me give you an example. You mentioned the widow giving 100 percent. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's Luke 21, 1 to 4, yes? Um, I, I could top my head, I don't know the scripture. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's right. I was looking at it yesterday. Um, okay. Yeah, the context before and after that verse is hypocrisy. After that verse, verse 5 and 6, Luke chapter 21, verse 5 and 6, is talking about the destruction of the temple. And before yeah. that verse, at the end of... Luke chapter 20, it's talking about the hypocrisy of the scribes. So Jesus is in the temple, he's talking about the hypocrisy of the scribes, and he says they devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. So Jesus is condemning religious leaders who use religion and take the Bible out of context to scam money off people. Then in Luke 21 verses 1 to 4, he uses, he sees a, a widow go up to, there was a big collection box in the temple where you could put your money in. And he sees a widow go up to the um, collection box and put two copper coins in. And he says, this woman has put more in than all they who have put in. Now, he's not saying you must give like her. It's an example of someone who's so brainwashed by religious uh, leaders that she's giving her last penny to these, um, to the religion of the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites who Jesus condemns two verses earlier. And then, sorry, someone just want to get the hoover. And then after that, um, uh, I'm in the community room, someone's just gone to get the hoover. Um, and then after that, um, he talks about the destruction of the temple. So the fact he's talking about the destruction of the temple means he's dealing with religious hypocrisy. He's not setting an example for us that we must give every last penny to religious organisations. Jesus never ever told us to give our money to religious organisations. He said give your money to the poor. The only instance where we find Jesus giving money to a religious organisation was under the Levitical law. You had to pay half a shekel once a year if you were a male between I think 20 and 60 and so Jesus and Peter he tells Peter to go and fish and he takes a coin out of the fish's mouth and that would be a shekel and so that's the half shekel temple tax for Jesus and Peter now that was that was a legal requirement under the law 
But when Jesus tells us to give money, he says, give your money to the poor. He never says, go to the local synagogue, find some Pharisees or scribes and give it to these people, give it to religious leaders. It's give your money to the poor, not to religious institutions. What do you think about my explanation of the context of the widow? The, widows, the, the, the widow in Luke 21, 1-4 is not an example for us. So I, I use that as an example. Of, and if you're going to talk about a percentile, you, you started the conversation asking about tithing. Yes. And about 10% giving, which I don't, uh, I don't hope to, because I said that's an Old Testament principle. If you're going to talk about any... If there was any example you want to talk about a percentile, I said the widow is an example of someone who gave in 100%. And she's she not, it's, even, even even the idea of what she's giving to, I, I, I think the, the idea, I, 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 like your, I like your, I like some of your exegesis that I don't, you know, I, it, it, for, for us it's, but the example is her heart to give, that she gave way more than any of these other, you know, religious, No, 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 no. They ha churches had no expenses. They had no buildings and they had no paid ministry. The money that was raised, all of it went to the poor. No one's taking a cut. You had nobody I'm taking a cut. So, yeah, the, the, the money simply went to the poor. And regard the poor widow in Luke, Luke 21 verses 1 to 4. What you must remember about that verse is the verse before says, these devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Now that's the hypocrites, the scribes, who Jesus is condemning two verses before the start of Luke chapter 21. These, make long, these devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Then Jesus gives an example of this, an example of somebody who is devouring a widow's house, who's taking the last penny from a poor deluded widow. And it's a religious leader called a scribe. And then, after the um, story of the poor widow, in Luke 21, 5 and 6, he says, Do you see this temple? Now, that's the temple. She's just put her two copper coins into the chest. Not one stone is going to remain upon another. It's all going to be pulled down. In other words, Jesus is sick of the whole religious system of devouring widows' houses, of scamming people for money, which we see all the time today, especially in my background is in Pentecostal churches. There are Pentecostal preachers who fly around the world in jets. They've got their own jets, private jets. Bishop, Bishop Adepio of Winner's Chapel, I've spoken to Winner's Chapel here in Plymouth, he's got a $50 million Challenger jet. $50 million Challenger jet. Yeah. Because I totally agree with all this. It's like, you know, this is, you know, so, so how should churches operate? Because for me, the, the second Corinthians 9 talks about taking up collections again, not, reluctant, not reluctantly giving, not under compulsion, God loves a cheerful giver. There is an idea of giving support. When I say church, I think your understanding is some building or some. No, no, it's not. It's the people. Scripture. No, it's not. Right. The church is the no, people. No, it's, it's not. It's not a uh, denomination. It's not a building. How does the church function without this idea of, of, of giving and collecting for the needs of the people? They don't. Somewhere? They don't. They collect for the needs of the clergy and the church leaders. That is where ninety percent of the money that's raised go. It goes on buildings and it goes on church leaders. If you look at the Book of Acts. Acts 14.23, churches were always run by a plurality of church elders. I think another verse is Titus chapter 1 verse 5. I could be wrong about that. But it talks about elders in the plural running the churches. So you had unpaid elders who received no payment. The only thing they did get, there was a daily distribution of food. And if you, if you were a teacher in the church, you went to the front of the queue and you got the best food. But that's all they got. There were no mansions. There were no golden chariots. There were no villas in Sicily. There were no 
best education for their kids, best togas, best sandals. The only thing you got was food. And churches were run by a plurality of unpaid elders, Acts 14.23. If you had 50 people meeting in someone's house... And you, that church is run on biblical lines that you had a plurality of elders who made the decision as a corporate group. Then out of a church of 50 people, you can't afford to have three or five elders paid for by everyone else. Each with their own mansion, each with their own chariot, each with a you know, pension, a salary, uh, a villa in Sicily, a second villa in Tuscany, holidays for the kids, a, a chariot for the kid when he gets to 18. Okay. In a short time, but I'm sorry that that's been your experience of organized religion. And I, 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 I've seen that. I, I study with many Baptists. I study with many Pentecostal people. I, 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 I totally agree on that. Um, uh, you know about your, about uh, your convictions, and you know I'm sorry that's been your experience. Yeah, we, you know we probably agree on many things and disagree on other. But and I appreciate you following that. I, I, like I said, this is this is probably uh, you know if I was in Plymouth, I'd meet up with you and we could chat. Choose a the cups some more, you know, but uh, it's just, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's difficult to debate these things further, just with, so, like I say, with the ministry that I have here to, 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 to run, you know, to shepherd the flock that I have here, but, but brother, I, I will pray for you, I, I pray that you'll find somewhere where you can find, uh, you know, you can be at peace out with the practices that they hold to, and the convictions that you have from the Bible, I respect your your desire to study out and to, to draw out the meaning of the text, mm. you know, and, uh, and I appreciate, you know, your iron sharpening iron attitude. I really do. Uh, just, you know, just, just, just you know, one, I'll... just, just one brief question, Mr. Price. The thief on the cross, he wasn't baptized, and yet Jesus said to him, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." And he died mm. after Jesus because the soldiers didn't break Jesus's legs because he was dead already, but they broke the legs of the two thieves. So he died after Jesus. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, he wasn't baptized. Yeah, what do you think about that? Well, <laughs> baptism is commanded in the Bible, but it's not something we have to do in order to be saved. Cornelius was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He didn't do the babbling they did today. He spoke with other languages in Acts chapter 10. Uh, he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's adopted as a son of God, therefore. And that is, and then they say, what forbids him from being baptized? I forget the exact verse. It's somewhere at the end of Acts chapter 10. So Cornelius, he's indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He speaks in other languages. He's an adopted son of God before his baptism. So he's saved before he is baptized in water because then... Peter says, what forbids him from being baptized? Or somebody there says, what forbids him from being baptized? Sure, well, but this is all, you know, you, you know, you know, I don't know whether you, you, you want to argue. Or, all right. You know, those of us must not argue, so I don't want to, I mean, I'd love to look at scripture, like I said, maybe I'll pass across again, but there's, there's, there's all these things are fully understandable in the scriptures. The Holy, I'm being indwelled with the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily mean you know, or having the gifts of the Holy Spirit being in Acts 2 or Acts 10 where the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened. And I agree with you in the Pentecostal line, it's a misunderstanding. Those, those things were only a two, two time occurrence of the Spirit falling in that way. So the fact that they were there doesn't mean they still didn't need to be converted. Acts 2, 36, 38, the scripture you mentioned at the end of Acts 10, um, you know, Acts 19. I mean, there's so many times where the spiritual gifts or the outpouring of the gifts does not necessarily resemble, does not necessarily equate to salvation. So we can, we can debate these things more. That the baptism is into the death of Christ. Doesn't equate you know, to it's salvation. It's, doesn't equate to salvation. So somebody is an adopted son of God. They're indwelt permanently by the Holy Spirit. They are a permanently adopted son of God. They speak in other languages to, as a sign that they are indwelt by the Son of, that by the Holy Spirit. Peter, I think it's Peter, says what forbids these from being baptised like, like we were also baptised somewhere at the end of Acts chapter 10. And you're telling me that they weren't saved, they weren't converted, they weren't saved? So, so the guys, so at the beginning of Acts 2, the guys blamed them their head, speaking other languages. Why does Peter then have to preach that they must repent and be baptised to receive the indwelling of the Spirit? Why, do, why does he say that? If they're not, if they're Sorry, already say that again, say, say, say that again. In the beginning of Acts 2, those that the day of Pentecost, the Spirit falls on, they have tongues, uh, they have, I mean, as in 
languages, they have uh, flames of fire. Why would Peter then preach the message he preaches, calling everybody to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Why, why would he preach that if they're already saved by the falling of the Spirit upon them? Um, well, baptism is, is commanded, but it's commanded for, for Christians as a sign of the new covenant, well, you, a sign that they're already you're saying. You're not my question. That's where we get into, like, well, can, I, can I, can I, can I yeah. answer, M Mr. Price? The word hina means in order that. Now, if Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, repent, in order to receive the baptism of sins, it would read Hina. And it doesn't read Hina. It reads Ice, translated for, which has a wide variety of meanings. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm fully aware you have two plurals and two singulars in Acts 2.38. And the word Hina, in order that, is not used. So if the Holy Spirit wished to, say, wished to say, we must be baptized in water in order to be saved, then Acts 2.38 would read Hena, not Ice. Ice is translated as Shore. Sure, ice, ice, this is, this is a classic. I'll, I'll, I'll go there a little bit. So Ice talks about the Holy Spirit. I don't, I do okay. not believe that. <laughs> right, let me finish, let me finish, because yeah, yeah. that's the majority of Protestant ideology. And then, and then you said, and I don't, and I haven't been baptized, and I don't believe I need to be, or I will just because it's a symbol. They would have laughed you at the church. Titus of Barnabas would have taken you aside and said, what in the world? Because this was the way people were saved in those days. Well, you have, you're offering no proof. You're offering no proof for that. Just telling me to go and study I'm, church I'm, history. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging, I'm encouraging you to go and read I have. I have in <laughs> translation. In in translation, I have yes. And yeah, so, 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 you know, Romans six was baptized into his blood. That, that is the time that the, the, the Colossians two that your old self is cut off. You're, you know, you are your your the sinful flesh is cut away. So the you know, you know Titus three, how are you saved by the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, you know, when you're baptized, you were clothed in Christ. These are, these are really key, key texts, Robert. And, and you know what? The Protestant church, I believe Satan has done a great job covering up what true salvation is. So we have all these other, you know, quick fixes, easy believers and ways. Yeah, I, 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 I don't believe that. I don't believe that, Mr. I, I, Price. I, I, I know you're not. I, know, I understand you're not advocating that. But, but I, I truly believe if you search and, and pray and see these things, that, that is, I, I just... I, I, can't, I can't be a, like, a, like I said, trying to be a, an evangelist for well, uh, in any other way, but call people back to the way that it was practiced back then. And that is the way. Re Revelation 3, Romans 10, these are such misquoted scriptures of salvation, this idea of, like, it's just not the full counsel of the message, Robert. And you, you sound a man well equipped with, with studying these things out, but, uh, you know, so that, let me leave it there, because otherwise, like I said, without, without having a Bible open, I don't want to give you just my opinion. I hope you don't, so I haven't given you just a well, I, I'm trying to, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have a Bible open either. I'm studying in a cupboard because men have come into the community room to have their tea break. So I'm standing in a <laughs> cupboard <laughs> holding the phone and uh, sure. I don't have a Bible in front of me either. Um, what I will say is um, the Catholic Church 
teaches that baptism is one of its seven sacraments. They used to have 30 sacraments in the Catholic Church, but they reduced it in the Middle Ages to seven. Baptism is one of them. So they believe you must be baptized, usually by a priest or by a Catholic layman, in order to be saved. Now, what's happened throughout the millennium is that the Catholics have had a, a terrible influence through the Latin Vulgate and through translators of various Bibles on making sure that passages like Acts 2.38 lean as heavily towards be baptized in order to be saved as they possibly can. And one verse, which is a, a dreadful verse, totally mistranslated deliberately, Acts 22.16, um, and I don't have a Bible in front of me. Um, it says, it says, I'll paraphrase, but it, it's, it's fundamentally uh, uh, Ananias saying, Paul, um, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Arise, and that's right, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That is a flat out mistranslation in the Latin Vulgate. Wycliffe copied from the Latin Vulgate. Tyndale used, because they didn't have access in the 16th century to a wide range of manuscripts. They often copied from the Latin Vulgate or from earlier English Bibles. So Wycliffe was influenced at that verse by the Vulgate. Uh, Tyndale was influenced by Wycliffe and it went into the King James Bible and it's a mistranslation because it's, it's a past participle, it's a past tense. Arise and be baptized. So Ananias does command baptism for Paul. Arise and be baptized having past tense washed away your sins. When? When he called on the name of the Lord on the Damascus Road. And that's mistranslated as a present tense. And it's, it's so convincing. I used to be a oneness Pentecostal in the 1980s. Uh, they're people who t teach modalism, that Jesus is the Father, and they also teach you have to be baptized to be saved, but with a special baptismal formula. Uh, it's different to the International Church of Christ. And that verse was a big, big verse in getting me into the oneness apostolic, Jesus only movement, oneness Pentecostalism. It's got a variety of names. Um, arise and be baptized, having washed away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, past participle. So Paul is already saved. And what's happened is passages like Acts 2.38 are pushed to the extreme, extreme, extreme um, pro-Catholic as far as they possibly can. They know it doesn't read Hina in order to. Acts 2.38 doesn't read repent in order to be saved. Hina. It doesn't read that way. It's ice. So they push ice as far as they possibly can to accord with Catholic doctrine. Then came along Thomas and Alexander Campbell and the Restoration Movement in the 19th century. And I'm not a scholar. I'm, I'm not a person with a PhD in Greek and Hebrew. I'm not that well educated but neither were Thomas and Alexander Campbell. So they picked up the King James Bible and they just went with the King James Bible, but they had no scholarly education. They had no knowledge of the original Greek and Hebrew. And so Thomas and Alexander Campbell were, were basically scammed because they weren't educated men and they fell for Acts 22.16. They fell for Acts 2.38 because they lacked the scholarly ability to critically look at the text in the original Greek language. And, Robert, I've got to go. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Price. I think thanks so much for sharing what you've shared. And, yeah, and, uh, um, you know, just, yeah, we appreciate it. Hopefully, our partners are close again. We can have a more, um, yeah, less, less of a, a, a kind of okay. like, broken conversation. And, uh, but I, I appreciate your time, Robert. But remember, you're, you're a church leader. You'll be held strongly accountable for what you teach by I, Jesus Christ. I, 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 Not to the same level. I don't attend any fellowship. I've given up. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with it. I've, I've too many people telling me Jesus is the Father. I'm finished with it. I don't want to know. And if you meet people who don't believe Jesus is the Father, they'll say they're Trinitarian, but they don't really know what the Trinity is. Uh, you, okay, what do you do in your church? Do you evangelize? Do you preach the gospel to the lost? No, we just spent hours singing songs and collecting tithes so the pastor can have a new house and a new car. <laughs> no. Anyway, thank you very much, Mr. Price. Lovely speaking to you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.